Yes, sir. 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 You can see it clearly, no? Yeah, yeah exactly. Very nice. So I put the ball in your court. Whenever you want me to start, I'll start. I said, as we can start, sir. We are on time. We are on time, sir. I think I'd love that. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning at the outset. Thanks to Ramesh and Sudeep for asking me to talk on coablation and radio frequency today. And I'll try to make it informative, as practical as possible. And um, if I would, I mean, are questions allowed in between or uh, do we keep it at the end of the topic? At the end of the topic, sir, better. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So, coablation first and foremost is that we need to understand that coablation is nothing but another rate. The energy used here is radio frequency, but it is low frequency radio frequency. And what happens in coablation is that whenever the electricity passes, it changes into radio frequency frequencies, which when mixed with saline creates a plasma field and this plasma field actually wherever you apply it to a target tissue it cuts through and it can even vaporize that particular part of it and here we need to understand that it is not a thermal process but it is a chemical process So what happens here? An electric field is generated between the active electrodes and um, one second. Yes, clear. And uh, you know, there are, whenever these electrodes are there, there is an active electrode and a return electrode. And when electric field is there, it causes radio frequency waves. These radio frequency waves in the presence of cell will excite the electrolytes, the sodium and chloride, and this causes the plasma energy, and the plasma energy starts ablating. So, in a simple format, when you see, the conductive medium is saline, energy is radio frequency, it creates plasma, and this plasma excites the sodium free radicals and electrons and that causes tissue break breakdown and the tissue breakdown is what we call it as ablation byproducts. We all know that there is a blue petal and a yellow petal in coablation. The blue petal is always to coagulate and the yellow petal is always to ablate. So the blue one I think there is I approve. Okay. The, the blue one has a maximum setting of phi. Okay. There's some line that has come in over here. I'm a little confused about this. And the yellow one uh, can go up to nine. My presentation is stuck because of something here that came in. What is this anno annotating? Sudeep, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, no, but um, why is my... Why is my slide not moving? Something popped up. You and Rahul Gupta can annotate it is written here. So, annotating is a request to annotate and share content. During annotating, you cannot control and share content unless the annotating is stopped. Re remote control request. Is somebody controlling my presentation? Hello? 
Is my screen seen? Not seen. No, sir. My screen is not seen. No, I can see you, sir. No, not the screen. Not the screen. Okay. I think Sudeep, you need to help me a little bit here. What has happened is my presentation is there. So my okay, now my presentation. Can you see it now? No. Not it, sir. Not it. Not no, sir. created the thing one second please i think i'm uh... one second where is the Can you see my screen, please? Not yet. Yes? Yeah, yes, sir. Now you can see the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody had uh, barged in. I typed something and a line came on to the thing and then it stopped moving. Oh, okay. Uh, somebody has budgeted in and wanted to... Anyway, okay. I'm sorry about this, but uh, I'll try to... So now, in terms of coagulation and coablation, there are little differences. In coablation, it is a high voltage used. In coagulation, it is low. And always remember, in coagulation, there's no plasma layer. And whereas in coablation, it, there is a plasma layer. And in many a time in coagulation, you don't require any saline. But coablation, a saline media, is an absolute important thing. And in coagulation, no tissue is removed, but here tissue is removed. So you need to understand that whenever you're using a coagulation pedal, there is a deeper depth of penetration and in coagulation, a shallow depth. So always use coagulation when you're controlling a bleeder. Actually, small bleeders can be controlled beautifully even by coagulation. So use as minimum of coagulation as possible. So we have an irrigation and suction of saline that should be always balanced. The saline irrigation provides the path between electrodes. That means when the saline irrigation is less, the coablation will not be at its optimum. And with the suction should be so good that it should be all the time removing the saline and dissolved tissue and byproducts. There are different wands available. The commonest one is called as EVAC-70 and this is called as a workhorse and it has a triple active electrode. It has a shaft that you can bend 
and you can use it even in adenoidectomy and it has complete integrated saline and irrigation and you know these are called turbinate ones reflex ultra 45 and reflex ultra ptr and these i will show it when i'm off i'll show you the videos i'll show you how these are being used other ones is reflex ultra 55 that can be used for tongue base and also you know you can use it for soft palate and ultra sp is where you have also a saline irrigation channel attached to it there are laryngeal wands that are present wherein you can use a larger one which is called precise lw and a very fine one called precise mw and all laryngeal lesions can be very comfortably you know operated by using this laryngeal wand one of the greatest advantages when compared it to the laser is that there is no risk of the airway fire that is something that we need to keep in mind and secondly the shaft is malleable sometimes you know you when you find it difficult to reach an area in the larynx you can nicely bend this and go over there and then do it so what are the few benefits of coagulation see very limited depth of thermal penetration minimal collateral damage there's a localized effect and effective controlled volumetric uh, tissue removal and the temperatures are between 40 to 70 degrees and another thing is healing also occurs with very minimal fibrosis not like the way when you use a uh, diathermy the disadvantages are you need training as a learning curve and we know that the wands are a little expensive so going back to the presentation i'm going to show you a few videos where uh, yeah i'll start off with something as simple as a pediatric adenoidectomy so this you're seeing the video now sudeep clear Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. yeah. So you have a thirty. I mean, a three mm zero degree scope put transnasally after decongesting, and the adenoid is visualized through the nose. This is from the left corner, and the wand that is used is a precise Max wand. In a precise max wand as compared to an evac wand, the ablation is more, it is a little more aggressive wand. And most of the time in removal of the coronal type of adenoid where there's a maximum amount of coronal adenoid, this wand is much more helpful than evac. And it, it does a much faster job. And uh, the trick over here is the saline irrigation should be at its maximum and, and always start in the center and start going laterally towards the, uh, eustachian cushions and the, the Main areas to be kept in mind is if you're looking at anteriorly the corner, posteriorly and inferiorly to the posterior pharyngeal wall, laterally up to eustachian cushions, completely the whole thing, and in terms of depth up to the buccopharyngeal fascia. You should be able to see the buccopharyngeal fascia. And many a time, a little bit of adenoid is present on the eustachian cushions itself. You can comfortably remove, especially in pediatric age group. This is on the left side. We are doing it. This is a classical pediatric adenoid. And I just wanted to show you... Yeah.
if you are seeing that the adenoid size is large, please go in with a precise max. But if the adenoid size is medium, like grade two and grade three, you can use an evac. So you go right up to your depth, up to the level of buccopharyngeal fascia completely. And on both sides, you should be able to see the eustachian cushions. So this is the use in adenoidectomy. Now, just to show you uh, adult tonsillectomy part using so here, so actually those people who are amphidextrous, who use both their hands, the left tonsil preferably to be used with the left hand and the right tonsil with the right hand. I am not amphidextrous, so I tend to use the right hand. And uh, the, there are different ways of doing a tonsillectomy with coagulation. Well, one is called as inferior to superior. The other one is called the superior to inferior. I, I normally do it superior to inferior because right from my, you know, post-graduation days, we are taught the classical dissection way of tonsillectomy. So here, normally a evac wand is used and the settings are by default seven and three. Seven is ablation and three is coagulation. And uh, normally the whole, this, this is a adult tonsil that we are doing. And uh, uh, if you have observed, very little of coagulation is used. So that is how the fossa would be in terms and, and um, this particular method if you have seen we have completely like you know opening a book that is on the right side if you have seen that uh, right from the upper pole down to the lower pole, the incision is given and the tonsil is, you know, pushed in medially and like a page completely using a, you know, the wand, the tonsil can be removed. So this is a, a simple thing of a tonsillectomy. Now, just to quickly run through to show you the other applications, I'll try to show you where we can use it in laryngeal cases. Okay. Sorry about it. One second. I'll uh, directly show you the videos from the others. Actually, there are so many videos in it. <clears throat> this is a case of laryngeal papillomatosis. And the advantage of doing laryngeal papillomatosis using a laryngeal wand is that, you know, the amount of tissue damage with this is bare minimal. And secondly, the chances of uh, airway fire is not there. And uh, you can use two types of wands. One is uh, LW and the other one is MLW depending on where you would like to. And most of the time when you're doing the removal of the papillomas onto the vocal cords, try and use the MLW. Rest of the place, the whole LW can be used. 
and bleeding can be beautifully controlled. I will just show you how it would be. So you can see the right vocal cord coming into the picture. The, this patient had completely filled and this patient actually, he came in a mild strider. We did not do a tracheostomy. We intubated the patient and we operated this case. So in terms of severe laryngeal papillomatosis, nothing like coagulation. It's quite comfortable and uh, I would say quite safe. So this is the final picture that we have got. We have removed the whole thing and this patient is doing pretty good. Even recurrence rates are not that, you know, they're not much of recurrence. Even sometimes if there's a small thing, you can remove it at a later date. So just that is about papilloma and a little bit about, um, this is a granular cell tumor on the left side and we had used a population for the granular cell tumor. After taking a bit of for biopsy, we have excised it. The granular cell is always uh, a little like an unripe fruit. It, it is not easy to ablate. It takes a little more energy and uh, Now this is the final picture where we have completely ablated the granular cell. And this patient's voice was pretty comfortable. I mean, it wasn't that bad at all. So using coagulation for uh, masses present, I would like to also show coagulator cord to me. Like, you know, cases of bilateral abductor palsy where you know the patient is in strider this patient was tracheostomized elsewhere and this patient came in and we took this patient up and we did a classical posterior podotomy for this patient So you can see the amount of, um, you know, vocal cord that needs to be removed sometimes. It is not like, you know, it's uh, the whole bit is quite muscular and edematous. And we were still not able to see the lumen. Now we could see the lumen. If you have seen, there's only a one third of the vocal cord anteriorly that was left back. Most of the thing had to be removed in this particular case because without removal, the airway will not be sufficient. This patient was very comfortable and had a quite uh, Comfortable voice to see the amount of space that has been created in this. Even the posterior part be removed. So bilateral abductor palsies, you can use a laryngeal wand. And even smaller lesions, like you know, for example, this carcinoma, you can have a look here that this is a case of carcinoma, vocal cord. After taking the biopsy, using a coablator, So the mask can be excised comfortably. So this is malignancies and smaller lesions like polyps, contact granulomas can be removed. So this is the contact granuloma. 
of the vocal cord. And the interesting part about the contact granuloma, it is notorious for it to recur. When you are using coablator because of the low temperatures, the thermal damage to the arytenoid perichondrium is not there to that extent. So the recurrence chances are also less when compared to laser where there could be a thermal damage. So that is the final picture. I think you got a clear cut picture there. Yeah. So even contact granulomas, you can use this or intubation granulomas, you can use it. So these are the few applications where I just wanted to show you. And uh, I'm going to show you a little bit in snoring and obstructive sleep apnea where you can use. So what I would like to show here is, now for example, um, in palatoplasties, you can use coagulation. So once you mark out the junction of hard and soft palate, you can. Uh, now this is a very simple case wherein you are doing a partial uvulectomy and a little bit of a posterior pillar excision because this is a case of upper airway resistance syndrome and uh, and. If you are seeing the wand that is being used over here, this is reflex ultra, wherein it is a thin, small wand and it can dissect out very well. And if you have seen, no tonsillectomy was done in this case. And we have done also a channeling, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, this is a palato pharyngoplasty. I would show you even how we have used coagulation. In... Can you hear my voice, Sudhir? Yes, sir. Very clear, sir. Very... Hello? Yes, sir. Very clear, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you. That is where you go about. Can you? What is the clarity of the picture? Very good, sir. No problems. Yes, sir. We have the picture. Uh, we have the picture with us, with us sir. Sudip, can you hear my voice? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ramesh? Yes, sir. You don't want to bang at the superior pole. This is. Do you require any kind of specific uh, requirements in that? Do you obstructive sleep? I think. Uh, there, I think there was a commentary coming in over there, na? Am I right? That is. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, anyway, that uh, I would uh, show you a little bit about uh, how this turbinate channeling is done. So, the terminate, there is a reflex, 45 that is being used and you pass it submucosally up to the, there are three marks inside, submucosally you pass it and then, you know, you apply the ablation part of it and then the turbinate shrinks. Possible there is a video that shows what happens after it is being done. See the way the turbinate is shrunk and there is an airway that is created. You can do one pass, two passes, or three passes depending on the amount of shrinkage that you want completely. So, this is in terms of turbinates 
the way it can be shrunk and uh, I would like to show you also in terms of hmm, a turbinate wand, how it works, I'll show you this video. Maybe you this will give you an idea. So this is the three level that is being put into the chicken leg. And after it is being applied, what happens inside is what I wanted to show you. All that area is completely ablated and it heals by scarring. And similarly, I would uh, want to show you a coagulation tongue base reduction. Again, which annotation request will come by? This is the tongue base. And here we have uh, put a boiled dave's mouth gag, a smaller blade, and we are using a 30 or a 45 degree scope to visualize the tongue base. And we are using a precise max with a slightly bent uh, in midway. And uh, what you see is the at six o'clock is the epiglottis. And this is a huge tongue base that can be reduced using an ablation mode. And normally for tongue base, we tend to use sometimes even nine in terms of ablation. So just to give you an idea for the tongue base, coablation is one of the best tools that can be used to reduce the tongue base. So that's the final picture that is till there. And in fact, if you want the epiglottis to be pulled front, the glossoepiglottic fold can also be ablated or coagulated so that it heals with fibrosis and pulls the epiglottis anteriorly. So that is about the tongue base part of it channeling and there is also second i think i've shown you larynx also somnoplasty i have shown and uh, there is a tongue channeling video which uh, is not my video but very interesting video for you to have a look Using a coablator, the person you can do in the midline, the base of the tongue channeling can be done. Coming anteriorly, midline is a safe area. And as you ablate it, you can see the muzzle twitching over there. You can go come anteriorly in the midline without any problems because there are no vessels over there superficially you can go laterally but you should never go deeper than two roughly about uh, i would say 2.5 centimeters is the depth that you look at where the vessels are so roughly between one 1.5 centimeter depth you can comfortably go laterally without injuring the vessels Even laterally, you can go in a superficial manner if you want to reduce the tongue using the coablator. I think I've given you a little idea into the how it can be used in snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. There is also a zeta palatoplasty and uvulopalatopharyngoplasty videos and Oh, or later you people. Yes, Amra. 
moment you see the of view. So this is the again there is a I think I'll I'll skip that. I wanted to also show you a little bit about coablation use in extended uh, endoscopic nasal surgery. For example, you have a meningoencephalocele and um, you can use it in meningoencephalocele's very comfortably. This particular patient, I will forward. So what you're seeing over there is the, that's the meningoencephalocele that is being reduced. So that gives, that is one place where you can comfortably use is in meningoencephalocele's right up to skull base you can use it reducing it right up to skull base and that's a hadath flap that is being put up after reduction completely and uh, i'll show you and you can see you can uh, use it in inverted papillomas inverted papillomas it is good Huge inverted papillomas, you can use coablation, completely reducing it. In this case, in between, we have even used radio frequency. But the inverted papilloma is... We did a Denker procedure also for this case. And um, I'm just showing the application so that you have an idea where all we have, you can use, you can use it in angiofibromas. I'm sure you have seen enough and more videos of angiofibroma and POV later. So angiofibroma cases also, you can comfortably use POV later. So this is in terms of coablation and um, I've shown everything pertaining to coablation so that you have a rough idea as to where all it has to be applied. Can I go ahead with radio frequency? Yes, sir. Or would, yes, you, like, sir. would you want or, or, or would there be somebody asking some questions pertaining to this? We'll, we'll take up an answer. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. I will, I will uh, see this particular presentation. We had a conference called RAFCOB where one of my team uh, members, Dr. B. Naveen, had prepared this presentation, which I'm sharing with you. So, in terms of if you're looking at radio frequency, I will tell you how it works in another presentation. This presentation will quickly tell you these are all the usages of radio frequency that is, and right from septoplasty, turbinate reduction, epistaxis polypectomy, endoscopic sinus surgery, rhinopyma, I use in rhinoplasty, DCR, CSF rhinorrhea, and even pituitary surgeries. And something like hemitransfixation incisions can be given with this. Just to, you can cut, coagulate with it, and glomus of the septum can be removed. Turbinate reduction can be done comfortably. Yeah. 
it has a bayonet or a bipolar um, you know applicator that can be used to shrink the turbinates so like coablation in radio frequency you can shrink the turbinates completely then adenoidectomy can be done using uh, radio frequency with the malleable suction using a um, you know zero degree scope you can completely remove the adenoids also. DCRs can be done with uh, radio frequency, especially opening the cell. Sinica released can be done. Like, you know, uh, masses present in the nasopharynx where it could be a vascular mask, you can comfortably use radio frequency to remove this mask. And um, you can use a bipolar radio frequency and you can coagulate, ablate, and then remove the mask also. like septal masses that were there, they are removed with radio frequency. I'm quickly running through because of the paucity of time, otherwise all the videos are there and could have shown. Juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibromas also we have removed with uh, radio frequency with a bipolar application. And of course, along with it, using cold instruments and a little bit of deep rider. In this case, we have used a navigation system. Lateral rhinotomies were done with radio frequency only. Completely to remove a mass in the medial canvas of the eye, so you can remove this. Like a diathermy, it can be used. So if you're really looking at you, we have used radio frequency posteriorly right up till odontoid process into hypopharynx and complete nose and paranasal sinuses. So hypophysectomies, those days we used to do transeptal. There also we had used it. Regular uh, posterior septectomy and pituitary surgeries also radio frequency was used. Then CSF rhinoreas, we have used radio frequency with very good results because the temperatures are not more than 90 degrees. So there is very little scarring and very little lateral damage that is there. So schwannomas we have used along with radio frequency and deep rider, we could remove it comfortably. Hadad flaps can be taken by with radio frequency. Hadad flaps are comfortably taken. Meningiomas along with neurosurgeons where we have used radio frequency even intracranially. This is again along with the neurosurgeon, we have done odontoidectomy where we have used radio frequency right up to the back. So what I wanted to put across is radio frequency is a very versatile thing and it can be used everywhere in ENT, in otology, everywhere, including even myringotomy you can do with radio frequency. And uh, all excisions, Postoral incisions, right from skin incision, we give with radio frequency. And gra graft harvesting we do. And like preauricular sinus, even glomus tympanicum, we have removed with using uh, radio frequency only. I mean, using radio frequency onto the promontory did not cause either vertigo or even any of the sensory neural hearing loss. Stepidotomies only up to endoral incisions, radio frequency was used. And oral and oropharyngeal surgeries right from ankyloglossias to retention cysts to tumors, silolithiasis, because we, we do a lot of silendoscopies, especially 
after doing a silentoscopy intraoral removal of the stone after identifying it and taking it in a basket we intraorally remove the stones using radio frequency completely the whole stone can be removed Then uvulopalatopharyngoplasties, zeta palatoplasties, expansion sphincters pharyngoplasties, all these we do it with radio frequency. I mean, there was an interesting case of a lingual thyroid also where we have uh, used, and this was published in the American Academy Journal in 2007. And laryngeal cases also we have used radio frequency. Bilateral abductor palsies, lesions of epiglottis, laryngomalacia, radio frequency can be used. Malignancies, radio frequency is used and with good results. So, coablation and radio frequency for an ENT surgeon, it's a wonderful tool. Somebody who's, uh, you know, not comfortable using laser everywhere, radio frequency and coablation combination really does wonderfully well. This is a chondroma we have removed with the radio frequency in the arising from the vocal cord area, just anteriorly, right from the cartilage, we have removed the whole thing. and hardly any bleeding. This is deep rider quadotomies, post-operative, and uh, pictures are there, and uh, then, uh, let me run through. This is um, dysphonia plicae ventricularis cases where the false cords can be reduced in size using Radio frequency, mass over the vocal cords can be removed. Yeah, we have even used it in thyroplasties where it, the cartilage was incised by radio frequency to make the windows. And thyroplasty type 1, type 3, we have used completely. papillomas, excision, even laryngeal webs can be comfortably removed with radio frequency. It can be used in head and neck, tracheostomy, cervical lymph node biopsies, laryngectomies, everything in head and neck you can use. I mean, um, most of the neck work we hardly use, uh, you know, diathermy. We use only radio frequency and the healing is excellent because of the low temperatures and uh, even the control is very good. So this is a little bit about radio frequency and um, let me just get out of that. A little introduction to radio frequency, please. I'll do that so that you'll get to know the whole thing. See, we should know how does an electrosurgical unit work Heat is generated at the tip and it is always slow for coagulation and shrinkage and fast for cutting and there will be always two modes, unipolar and bipolar modes. So when you're looking at pottery or laser, 
you will always see in a laser the temperature at the end will be 600 to 800. And in a cautery, the temperatures are 400 degrees centigrade. And you always observe there is charring. That black color itself shows that there is charring. Where there is charring, there is going to bound to be more of fibrosis. So what is this radio frequency concept? This is again an electro electrosurgical unit itself, but here the frequencies are very much higher than that of a diathermy. Like for example, if you're looking here, you will see that the diathermy works on 300 to 500 kilohertz, whereas radio frequency works from 1.5 to 4, 4, 4 4.5 megahertz. So that is where the frequency is at a much higher level. And here the basic difference is when it is in kilohertz, the waves pass around the cells. So that is how they get burnt and they get charred. When in a higher frequency, the waves pass through the cell. So when it passes through the cell, what happens? These waves cause boiling of the intracellular fluid and causes a cell burst or called as volatilization. And here the tissue heals with very minimal fibrosis. So the temperature here is 65 to 95 degrees as compared to laser or pottery where it is 400 to 600 and that is where the carbonization occurs. When there is carbonization, there is granulation. When there is granulation, there are two things, either excessive scar or there is a possibility of a post-operative infection. We hardly see any post-operative infections in radio frequency. So what are the types of radio frequency units here? You will see that there is a single frequency, dual frequency, and like I told you, coablator is also a radio frequency unit. But here you need a saline medium. Low frequencies is from 1 megahertz to 2.9 megahertz. High frequency is from 3 megahertz to 4.5. There are some machines with dual frequency that is 1.7 and 4. So what is it that you have radio frequency is there are different waveforms. Like if you look at a diathermy, there is a cut or a coagulation. These are the two things. But here if you see there is a fully filtered cut form. So here if the your probe is thin like a wire, you can even use it on the skin. So the next waveform is cut and coagulation. That means it is cutting and coagulating. There is a third form called as only coagulation. And again in the coagulation, you have a contact and a spray mode. That means without even touching, keeping it far away, <coughs> you can use it as a spray. There is a bipolar and the interesting part is fulgration. Like if you use a fulgration mode in adenoid, it will completely fulgrate the whole mass. Any mass can be fulgrated with radio frequency. So if you look at this particular chart, you will clearly see under cut it is 90% cut, 10% coag. Cut, cut, cut coag is 50-50, whereas in coagulation is 90% coagulation and fulgration it's a spark mode. Bipolar, it will be only for hemostasis. This is one principle which is very important that each and every ENT surgeon should know when we are using these equipment, including diathermy, including diathermy. This is called as lateral heat formula, which is T-I-F-W-E. T is time. That means at a place, how much of time have you kept your probe? The faster you keep, lesser the lateral heat. Second is intensity of power. The more the intensity you keep, the more the lateral heat. Three is frequency. So the lower the frequency like diathermy, more heat. Higher the frequency like radio frequency, less heat. Waveforms, if you keep it on cut form, 
very little lateral heat. But if you keep it on coagulation, the heat will be more. And electrode size is something we should always keep in mind. The thinner the electrode, the lesser the heat generated. Taking this formula, you should know where and how you need to use your electrodes. And see that less lateral heat is generated. These are some of the bipolar uh, probes that are used for tongue base reduction and turbinate probe wherein, you know, when you apply it, it has a sheath which is about one centimeter that prevents the radio frequencies to pass so that the surface area is not damaged. But the radio frequency causes, you know, the certain amount of radio frequency ablation of the tissue. And you can see inside that the superficial area, there is no damage, but deeper part, and that heals with fibrosis. When that heals with fibrosis, there is shrinkage of tissue, and that is how the tongue base is reduced and the turbinates are reduced. So if you compare a radio frequency with electrocautery, you can clearly see Whereas you can simultaneously use cut and coagulation here and you cannot in cautery. Lateral damage is minimal, heat generation is minimal, scarring is minimal, faster healing and less slough and less post-op infection. Even if you compare it with laser also, temperature, lateral heat damage and uh, in fact, I will, the first statement uh, I'm not agree completely what I've written there. Most probably preci precision part of it, both are precise. Laser is also precise and uh, even control of depth, both are all can be controlled in terms, but definitely lateral damage, radio frequency is definitely less lateral damage than laser. These are all the, I think surgery is part of it. I have already told and I will not show about this, but I would definitely like to show you a video of tongue base. This is all expansion sphincter. Ah. This is how the tongue base, this I've done it under local anesthesia. The video which you're seeing over there with only local injection. This is a second application to the tongue base where we did a zeta palatoplasty. And you can reduce the tongue base two to three applications and it definitely shrinks, comes anteriorly and the retrolingual space can be increased. So that is regarding the tongue base, lingual tonsillectomy. All these procedures can be done. On larynx also you can do it, especially in children where you want to, in my laryngomalacia cases, where you want to do a glossoepiglottoplexy or supraglottoplasty, you can comfortably use a radio frequency and do it. Tracheostomies, you can use it. So the advantage of radio frequency is low temperature. So there is no risk of myoglobinuria, which is seen in laser surgery. Scar tissue is minimal. Skin incisions can be given. Pain is less. Healing is faster. Cosmetic results are superior. And actually, I have a separate presentation of radio frequency and cosmetic surgery. It is used a lot in cosmetology. Bleeding is minimal, excellent hemostasis, cost-effective, does not take up a lot of space in OT, and no special protective gear required, and it does not interfere with your histopathological reporting. Especially if you keep it on a cut mode and you take a piece and send for histopathology, it doesn't affect the reporting at all. So in terms of complications, this is something I would like you to remember. It is only because of improper technique that you have complications with radio frequency. Intraoperative, laceration, deep wound, hemorrhage, all these because of improper technical applications, mucosal ulceration, scarring. Only there is one contraindication for radio frequency, that is a person with a pacemaker. 
So that is one question you need to ask before you use radio frequency, whether he is on a pacemaker. Apart from that, radio frequency is indicated in all other cases. So to conclude, high frequency radio surgery is useful in surgeries, all ENT surgeries, including pediatric ENT surgeries, and gives a clear and bloodless operating field with minimal lateral heat damage to the tissues. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for an excellent presentation, sir. I think uh, I have uh, I have closed it in time. Yes, sir. Perfect on time, sir. As a, as always. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you for an excellent presentation. And uh, anyone having any doubts can uh, uh, please please. Uh, uh, good morning, Dr. Dean Dalgaru. Uh, ah, this is Dr. Vishnu. Dr. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, good morning. Yeah, it, it was a very excellent uh, presentation and we learned a lot today. Yeah. Yeah. I have a couple of questions for you, Dr. Dindal. Please. Uh, like, uh, yeah, MW van being used for uh, laryngeal papillomatosis. Yeah. Uh, I would like to the tip can precisely reach the subepithelial plane that MW van. Yes, please. The okay. laryngeal papillomatosis is a mucosal disease. Yeah. So we don't want the thing to go deeper. Like, you know, the especially on the vocal cords, we don't want the superficial lamina propria to be damaged or the vocal ligament to be scarred. So yeah. the MLW has got such a fine thing that you can beautifully go into the subepithelial thing. And I, here I would like to also mention there is a new one that has come by Bonds, the Chinese one. They have uh, come forward with a fine point thing, fine point thing. In fact, I, have, I haven't shown you that video. I have used it in a case of spasmodic dysphonia to do a, what we call it as a micro uh, myoneurectomy of the vocal cords. And that wand has been really helpful and the patients are doing very well, spasmodic dysphonia cases also. But the better than ML is the wand, wand, I'm not getting the name, but that is a very fine tip. And like you said, you can beautifully dissect it out, the whole of the mucosa, in the submucosal plane without much damage to the superficial lamina propria or even to the vocal ligament. Thank you. And uh, another thing, like uh, you have any like uh, selection uh, for uh, between uh, RF and the uh, coblator for uh, nasopharyngeal angiofibroma, you base your selection on any imaging modality or clinical modality. How is your experience? See, my experience, nasopharyngeal angiofibromas, uh, I am not as aggressive as the big names that are there in uh, India, but smaller size ones, I don't embolize, but anywhere from medium size onwards, we tend to embolize. And the usage is both radio frequency and, and coablation because for certain times what happens in coagulation, certain part of bleeding is a little difficult to control. But the minute radio frequency we can use either bipolar or monopolar using the suction uh, radio frequency. So as you are sucking, you can you know you can apply radio frequency frequency and coagulate that area. A combination of both has been used and the results are really good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I Thank would you, say if somebody asked me a question between coagulation and radio frequency, which one would you advise to take? Say it's worthwhile for every ENT surgeon to take both of them. Oh, both would okay. be a much better option. Sure. You'll forget, you'll forget about either of them. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, 
So I'm talking about the Vishnu. Yes, thank you. So yeah. the, thank the you. Lo lots of messages inbox. Thank you for excellent presentation. Ah, thank you, Sudeep. Thank you. Sir, is, is it the A7071 something? 7171, I think the Chinese, the bonds van. That's a LMW van, sir. That, that is a new want introduced exactly about some three months or four months ago. Something like A70s. 70s. Uh, I picked up that, uh, the first piece I picked up, yes. that want, and I tried it. Okay, sir. And it's really good. It's really good. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Come. Thank you. Sir, uh, what's the cost of radio frequency ablation mission, sir? Somebody asked me. See, there are, uh, see the, um, the company that is now at present, which is good and is available in India, is uh, Sutter, Sutter Companies. And there are two models. One is a Curis and the other one is BMC. The Curis model almost costs about 15 to 17 lakhs. And the other one costs between 5 to 7 lakhs. Thank you, sir. But once once you have a radio frequency machine that will last with you for 15 to 20 years. No problem. I have a radio frequency machine I'm using from 1996. Sure. That was, that is, uh, we have five radio frequency machines. That is the usage. And the first one was from Elman in United States. And 1996, we got it. It still works. It still works and it does wonderfully well. So that means that investment is a solid investment. Your recurring expenditures is only electrodes and, you know, your hand pieces and other things. But uh, main machine, there's hardly anything. Sir, one of the delegates wanted to visit your center. Oh, sure. Ah, I wanted to, in fact, put this point across straightly. Those who are interested to learn on radio frequency or coablation, please uh, get in touch with uh, the AOI, you know, Telangana branch, Dr. Ramesh, and he can definitely organize either a Tuesday or a Friday to come and see the cases that have been done at our place. Those are the days we have a big list and you can comfortably come and see the application of radio frequency and coablation in different uh, cases. Uh, try to arrange a workshop at your institute. Sure. That's a better idea. Anybody, anybody who is interested, let them get in touch with you, Dr. Ramesh. Yes, sir. And yes. then you can always uh, put them across. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good, Good morning. Sir. Thank you. Uh, thank Good you for morning. the wonderful presentation, sir. I am Dhruv Kapoor. I am a PG resident final year in uh, Delhi presently. Uh, sir, I want to... Uh, I wanted to know about the voice outcome that you uh, that is there in cases of laryngeal surgeries uh, that are being performed using co uh, coblation and radio frequency. How do you compare it with the laser uh, use? I, I will not uh, use the word that comparing it with laser, but I will make this statement as good as. Okay, as good as laser. Okay. And, uh, and uh, I have a complete presentation of pre-operative, intra-operative, and post-operative. And a pre-operative voice recording and post-operative voice recording of different pathologies. I mean, I can even run up to two to three hours of these cases where we have used radio frequency and where we have used coablation. Okay. Thank you, sir. I, I don't use laser at all. I don't use laser at all because I'm very comfortable using this. In any given situation, it's very comfortable. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I, uh, thank you so much, sir. Thanks for an excellent presentation. Thank you, Sudeep, and thank you, Ramesh. Thank you, sir. Really. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, sir. Thanks. Bye. Harsha, now you can end the session.